something that was not so funny was, and you mentioned this, uh, was when uh, John got COVID very, very early in the pandemic. I mean, I remember this happening real time, the way that you describe uh, sort of moment to moment, how it went down is really, it brings us back, back to that time. I mean, luckily not everybody here had to deal with people actually getting it uh, that early when there was really very little information, but you did, you both did. Mm -hmm. And I think um, part of that is that people, it's in our rearview mirror in many ways, and you kind of just don't want to even think about it. Uh, I have a quote in there from our governor who did a good job managing our state through COVID, and he said to me when he was in his election, he said, you know, when you save someone from drowning, they appreciate it for the rest of their life, but they don't want to hear about it every day. Mm -hmm. And people, I think they just don't want to look back, but there's actually reasons mm -hmm. to look back. And for me, it was deeply personal. John got it way early on, not way before there was a vaccine, but before anyone knew what to do. I think mm -hmm. there were 19 cases. He was in a little hospital, Mount Vernon in Virginia, at the time, hospitalizations in Virginia, uh, when he got it. The, uh, just the serendipity of how people got it. Um, uh, the former president was saying at the time that it was just, you know, kind of downplaying it all the time. And yet we now know from Bob Woodward's book, actually, that he knew a lot more than he revealed. And at the time, we thought you could just get it from surfaces. And if you wipe things down, you were OK. That's how early it was. And mm -hmm. so he was, it was back when you didn't get tests back for 10 days. So by the time if you could even find a test. No. Well, by the time he's in the hospital, he still hasn't gotten the test back because he was so sick. He was sick two weeks leading in. And you couldn't visit. You couldn't be there. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, and so many people went through the same thing, but they lost their loved one. They weren't even there to hold their hand. Uh, they weren't even there to be with them. And I think to make sure that we remember that so that we're pre better prepared and that we believe in science and that we support the research. I talk about Dr. Fauci as the truth teller through so much of this. And he was once asked, well, don't you feel like you're complicit by standing up there all the time? And he said, nope, this is my job. I know people think that if they don't agree with whatever someone's saying that's standing next to me, but I believe I've got to do that. I never once, nope, thought of leaving my job. Um, those kinds of things are important to know. And the last thing is, um, I have sometimes asked if John has any long haul symptoms. And I note in the book at the very beginning that yes, he had one. And that is that every time we go down and I say we have to clean the basement, he goes, it's too dusty. I had COVID. <laughs> I can't do that. Now, that joking aside, uh, we know there's a lot of what I call in the book remains of the day. And this mm -hmm. is just one chapter of the book, but from this, including mental health people are struggling with long haul COVID. Um, and just still the economic effects of it. So I just thought it was important to take that from that personal standpoint. Yeah, no, I mean, and the mental health is, could, we could sit here for five hours and talk about that. You also, and you mentioned this, this is on the cover of the book, uh, were diagnosed with breast cancer mm -hmm. during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And you were very, very open about the fact that you delayed your regular mammogram like so many people did because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Well, at first it made sense. They were not doing routine exams, but that was only for a few months. And when you really think about it, it was almost safer to go to a doctor's office, right? Than it was to go grocery shopping mm -hmm. and other things I did. But like so many people, I'm like, oh, well, I can't go do that. Mm -hmm. And so I did delay it. And then when I found out um, uh, that I had uh, stage 1A breast cancer, I was there, here I am, and I don't know what to do. You're in the middle of the pandemic. Called doctors, figured out um, where to do, where to go, what it meant, um, and I tell stories from that that were very personal. I literally, ten minutes after I got that call, I was back mm -hmm. on the Senate floor voting, um, surrounded by you know a bunch of people I wasn't going to tell because someone was going to leak it if I did. Sorry, uh, and I, <laughs> I, I, I just decided that I wanted to make it my own story. And then I ended up going into having the surgery about a month later. It was probably going to be a lumpectomy, but you give permission for a mastectomy. And I tell the story that, well, most of what happened to me is what happens to everyone. You're just feeling very alone in this thing, and you're trying to figure out what to do. This was unique. I was laying in the uh, bed waiting to have the surgery, target on me, 
know that we, you know how that is when you're sort of with this thing up there. They've taken my my phone's not there and there. And a constituent came up who saw me and said, ah, if I could just have a moment, I want to talk to you. <laughs> I want to talk to you about Burma. <laughs> and I actually knew a lot about it, but I'm like, I know it's really tough there right now. But no, I, she goes, well, no, it's really bad. And so we talked for like 10 minutes about <laughs> Burma. And I said, well, I promise I'm going to help. I'm going to follow up, but I don't have my phone because, you know, I'm, I'm going into surgery. And when you're supposed to be in this zen-like yeah. thing and they're putting you to sleep and other people are like counting sheep, I'm literally saying to myself, don't forget Burma, don't forget Burma, don't forget. And then I wake up and I feel really sick for the anesthesia. John's there and I look up at him, he's so nice, he's got a plant and all this stuff. And he looked at me and I go, was it a lumpectomy or a mastectomy? He goes, it was just a lumpectomy. And I go, great. And then I go, ah, can you give me my phone? I, I gotta call the staff about Burma. <laughs> so that was like bad. But um, other than that, I think so many of what I went through and the ability to when it was done, mm -hmm. to be able to um, tell the story. A few months later, I found out I'm cancer free, still am. And I was able to, um, I was able to tell it, including the radiation, everything. And I was able to tell that story. And as a result, we got tons of letters from the office of other women that had put up their mammograms mm -hmm. saying that they had put it up and that they got it yeah. done. And that they, um, and one of them I actually called because I used her letter with just her first name in the book. So at the, about a year later, I call her and I said, do you mind if I put this in there with your first name? And she goes, you won't believe this. I am in the doctor's office right now in the clinic waiting for my checkup. And she called me three days later and said, 100% great. great. So um, those are and stories. So that, th you, know. you said that there are, I mean, there's so many laugh out loud parts of this book, just staying on the, on the cancer story. I just have to read this. This is uh, what you write about when you, well, there are two things I want to read. One is when you found out and then you had to go vote. You mm -hmm. said, consider being a US senator surrounded by men who have no idea what's going on. It is a recipe for hard times and dark thoughts. These guys have no idea what I'm going through. And I wish it happened to them once, not cancer. But that was hot that flashes. That was hot flashes. That was hot flashes. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. I was going to correct it before you did. This is about hot flashes. Like right now, when that guy is giving that obnoxious speech, the hot flashes keep you up at night and drive you especially nuts during hot weather. I personally believe, this is my favorite part, that if men experience menopause and hot flashes, there would be a whole lot more research and potential solutions. But for cancer patients, there are certainly limited remedies outside of um, not very useful medications. Um, the fact that you as a female United States senator feel comfortable <laughs> enough to write about hot flashes and about the reality that it is true that women have to deal with so many medical mm -hmm. issues that, you know, God forbid a, a man had to deal with this for five minutes, there would be a cure. <laughs> Sorry, I just, man. I don't know what I can add to that, really. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, yes. Um, so I think the first thing I was talking about before, which is people have to talk to each other again, and they have to respect each other's views and try to have discussions about things. I, I truly believe that. The second is that there are some really long-term issues uh, that we haven't dealt with as a nation. Um, one of them is actually um, more on the issue before us, which is why they're so passionate. Uh, the second thing is immigration reform um, with everything you're seeing. And in some parts of the country, we don't have enough workers. Um, the third thing is our uh, workforce training and making sure that we have childcare, that we've got uh, housing, affordable housing. And so one of my frustrations with the Senate along, among many right now um, is just that we have this thing, which I have a section in on the book called the filibuster. Actually, the section is entitled <laughs> Mr. Phil E. Buster. Uh, and I recount the story of going into a meeting once in Minnesota and taking quick call and saying to uh, my uh, young staffer from Minnesota, or remind me to call DC about the filibuster when I come back. I come back and he had these post-it notes where he wrote on things about what we needed to do. And the post-it note said, 
call Mr. Phil E. Buster, <laughs> uh, which we joked about for quite a while later. So I, uh, there are like 160 exceptions to the filibuster right now. Mm -hmm. And there's just so much hypocrisy in the whole thing. So right now it takes 51 votes to uh, put on Supreme Court justices, right? For various reasons. I won't get into how that all happened, but it's 51 votes. But it's 60 votes to codify Roe v. Wade into law. Um, it is 51 votes to reverse certain rules, but it's 60 votes to put them into law. So one of my issues is when you have things like background checks for guns that have 80% of the public with us, we should at least be able to have a vote and not be blocked uh, by that. I actually think that would build trust. I know it's counterintuitive because in some ways the full buster, you've got to get to 60, all those things. But I just think there's so many things that are not dealt with. Uh, where I do believe we'd have some colleagues that would vote with us, honestly, when push comes to shove, if we could have a vote, um, but we can't get to that vote. So um, that's one of the things, changing these rules where it takes so long to confirm a president, no matter what party he or she is in, it takes, half these Biden people aren't even confirmed yet because they're just, it's just a morass of timing and I would make changes to that to make it go better. Just things that you can build trust in government ethics rules for the Supreme Court. <laughs> ah, uh, I just think that there are things that, that would help. Now, on the other flip side of it, I have very good relations across the aisle, but what do I see as problems? Well, um, the fact that we have all of this dark money in politics and there are ads run and you don't even know who's running them. No one takes responsibility for the negative ads and that McCain-Feingold uh, basically got thrown out uh, because of the fact um, that the Supreme Court decision in that Citizens United case. So I would flip that. I would have a constitutional amendment to change that because you just don't have a balance with the citizens because there's all this money flowing in and money on both sides, honestly, and you don't know who it's from, where it's spent, those kinds of things. Uh, going on TV together, Democrats and Republicans, oops, radical idea. <laughs> Dana is, um, a, uh, by the way, a broadcaster that has both Democrats and Republicans go on her shows. And I think the idea is to, it's not always debate, sometimes you agree. Uh, Grassley and I have a major bill um, to do something about the power of monopoly tech companies so they can't put all their own product. Uh, um, the idea that uh, Senator Kennedy and I have a bill on uh, making sure that news organizations are justly compensated for their content from Facebook and Google. Um, these are all bipartisan efforts. Um, I, I, there was just, we just passed some bipartisan bills today, um, including one on revenge porn. Um, and so that was bipartisan, that's true. Um, and so it is with Senator Cornyn. There is a lot of work that goes on and I think sometimes it gets, um, people don't notice it and infrastructure bill the initial gun safety bill, uh, the semiconductor work we did, all of these things were bipartisan. So highlighting some of the positive when we do get things done together is really important. Yeah. Uh, on that note, another audience question. Our federal government remains stymied and unable to stop gun carnage. 25,000 women with Here for the Kids are planning action on June 5th in Denver to demand Governor Polis sign an executive order banning guns. Other blue states will be next. Should these states' efforts succeed and the cases end up with SCOTUS, with the Supreme Court, do you have any advice for how all progressive women can leverage this moment to save yeah. children? Yeah, we just had a, a major discussion about this today. And I have gotten to this point, I have always uh, been in favor of gun safety legislation. And it actually goes back to when I was a prosecutor um, and I joined with police chiefs. Um, and I come from a very strong hunting state, uh, but I always look at this and say, does my Uncle Dick need an assault weapon in the deer stand? Um, and I've he heard doesn't. that before. Okay, yeah, I Maybe at a New Hampshire but it's really stop important or for Iowa stop. People or... to understand that there are a lot of law-abiding yeah. gun owners too. And so when you look at it that way, you think, okay, how can we get guns out of the hands of people that shouldn't have them? Why are 18-year-olds waiting these, these, the perpetrators in Uvalde, that fourth grade class, and in Buffalo, with the, including the dad that just went to get his little boy a cake and never returned. So I'm gonna I'll go back to the gun issue here. So those people that committed those crimes um, deranged 
uh, young men were 18. They waited till they were 18 and they bought those assault weapons off of the internet. Um, and so the fact that we, I would ban the purchase of assault weapons. Um, and even if we started with 18 to 21, it would make a difference. The background check, something where 80% of the public agree. Um, magazine limits, there's just so many things we can do. And a story that's not in the book, I was just in Nashville a few weeks ago and I was in Ann Patchett's bookstore because um, I wanted to go by there and see it and I met her and I stopped by the school and this mom just walks into the bookstore and she's sobbing and she has books she's getting for her daughter and her daughter was a third grader that was in the same class uh, with the other uh, three kids that were killed mm -hmm. and her daughter saw her friends killed and those were her best friends and she took out her phone and showed Ann Patchett and me uh, the um, text from the morning of the shooting. And it was moms planning a jazz festival at their school. And it started out uh, with just them planning it. And then all of a sudden, one of the moms says, there's a live shooting at the school. And someone else said, that must be wrong. It's wrong on the internet. And then the next one that came is one saying, no, I hear sirens, I hear sirens. And then they go on and know it's happening. And then you find out they're all at this uh, fire station and then Hallie's alive, she's alive. Hallelujah, she's alive, she's alive. And you see text after text after text. And then the very last text is the mom that had said that there's a live shooting and she says, we lost Evie. Um, when you see that in the real time text, you realize that these kids have a right to be able to go to school. Uh, they have a right to uh, be able to go to a mall like in Texas on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, they have a right to be kids. Um, and so that's why I feel so strongly about this. And you see more and more um, momentum on this issue. So whoever wrote this, you know, don't give up. Okay. Uh, you, you have a lot of first person accounts in here of moments that will mm -hmm. um, forever be talked about in, in history books and one of them was January 6th. Not only were you there, you had a very, very crucial role as chair of the Senate Rules Committee. Um, and you, you had a feeling about how bad it was gonna be earlier than others. You wrote, I immediately yelled out to my colleagues, everyone stay away from the doors. There are reports that the rioters have entered the Capitol and shots have been fired, stay away from the doors. I was immediately approached by a senator who said, Amy, stop scaring people. Stop scaring people, don't say that. And you're in a very gracious way, you say, we will let history be my witness as to who was right about that. A lot of people said things they regretted that day. Yeah, so uh, that day, uh, Roy Blunt and I ran the Rules Committee. And remember the Georgia Senate race had happened the night before. We knew that Warnock and Ossoff uh, had won. We knew I was gonna become chair, but Roy was chair then on that day and I was a ranking member, and we had such a strong friendship, and I worked together for so long, it didn't matter who was chair, actually. And we knew there were gonna be objections, right? We knew that there were a number of senators, uh, first led by Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley, uh, that were gonna object, and we thought it was gonna take like 24 hours, but we also knew we had like 90 votes out of 100 to uphold the electoral um, uh, college numbers, um, but never, did we ever think after being assured that it was gonna be okay uh, by uh, security uh, that anything like this was gonna happen. So the morning begins with the celebration, the ceremonial walk from the Senate to the House with these pairs of pages, three pairs of pages carrying these mahogany boxes as they've done um, for decades and decades filled with the electoral um, ballots. And we take that walk and we go, and then the first objection is made to Arizona. We go back, that's when the debate happens. I follow Cruz. I remember quoting uh, a Roy's story about how he had a uh, statue in his office called the Unknown Cleric. And it was a guy, it was a beautiful statue that had been made, they dated it about 150 years ago. And it was clearly someone, a religious figure, and they had done all this research, no one could ever figure out who it was. And when he took senators and school kids in his office alike, he would always say, what does this teach you? Well, it teaches you uh, that most people aren't gonna remember who any of us are 150 years, but what they're gonna remember is what we did. And I made that point that it was our job to take on what I called the coup fighters, not knowing there was gonna be an insurrection. 
So then we're shut down. You've all seen maybe January 6th committee, the leaders go, Chuck and uh, Mitch and, and, um, and Nancy and Kevin McCarthy go to run room. Well, we were in the other room with every, all the other senators. Um, and it was actually kind of an incredible day. Roy spent it talking people down from doing all these objections because once the Senate was cleared and we believed it would be, um, we had to go back and do our jobs. I spent it trying to make sure everyone stayed there, including after the insurrectionists left, we still had hours to make sure that they hadn't left anything behind like anthrax. And I remember telling the uh, aides and the police that they had to get some food in there and just go into the Dirksen cafeteria and bring in whatever you can find so they won't leave. Um, and we ended up getting to go back there at, I don't know, 10 o'clock or so. And we worked out all the objections. And finally, at 3.30 in the morning, everyone had gone home from the Senate, except Roy and me and Vice President Pence. And those three pairs of pages, the <laughs> same ones, with the mahogany boxes filled with the ballots up to Wyoming. But this time we walked over broken glass, spray painted pillars with racist vulgarities, but we did our job and we got to the house. And two weeks later, we had that inauguration under that beautiful blue sky with Lady Gaga belting out the Star Spangled Banner <laughs> saying, and our flag is still there. Um, and um, <laughs> the most Memorable thing was Amanda Gorman, 22-year-old, youngest poet ever in the inauguration in that bright yellow coat. Um, and the line that you probably don't remember that I will never forget, and is why I wrote this book, that we must find light in that never-ending shade. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was what that day was about. Um, and I'm not, things have been rough since then, that's for sure. But that was a day when all our leaders um, went up there, with the exception of one who maybe someone saw in a town hall last night. All of the leaders. What are you talking about? I don't know. I just thought I'd bring it up. All of the leaders gathered on that inaugural stage, and we took back that platform uh, that they had first invaded. And that's why behind us wasn't real windows. It was plastic, because we couldn't get the windows fixed in time. That we had used white paint to paint the pillars, because they couldn't get the stuff that had been spray painted on the pillars. Um, one of the artists that were supposed to sing canceled with like two or three days to go and Garth Brooks filled in and we didn't even know he was gonna sing Amazing Grace. Mm. And so it was just felt like everyone knew what their job was that day. Can you tell the 21 gun salutes? Oh story? yeah, Oh, well, we are on the uh, inaugural stage. I'm looking at John because he, he remembers this. He was sitting next to me. And because it was a pandemic, there weren't a lot of staff up there and no one was really getting us of when we were supposed to go up there. And so I felt more like I was running a, like a Rotary Club uh, <laughs> a, a ham and eggs breakfast every day. I mean, it was like, I kept, so in all the pictures, instead of looking ahead, it looks like I'm looking at my phone. I'm looking at a piece of paper that was the TikTok for the day because I was so worried someone wasn't going to go up there and I had to run and tell Roy, time for you to go. <laughs> it's unbelievable. So I went up there. I introduced, I think I introduced uh, uh, Justice Roberts when he died. We introduced blah, 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 and did all this stuff. So here's the big moment. Um, uh, Biden is, is now um, uh, president. He's been sworn in and he's going to give his remarks. But according to the TikTok, and I'm supposed to introduce him and get to say as the first person to introduce the new president. So I'm standing there, but there's supposed to be a 21 gun salute. And I'm standing there and he's standing there with me and there's nothing. And I go, literally the, the, the TVs are going, is something wrong? What's wrong? And I go to him, there's supposed to be a 21 gun salute. And he goes, <laughs> he goes, I know. <laughs> And uh, so then I, then I, then, then they announced, uh, everyone, please sit down. Look, look, voice of God. And so he sits down, and then I'm like, <laughs> so I go over to Roy, and I'm like, 21 gun salute. He goes, I don't know. This is <laughs> Meanwhile, they are guessing that there's some kind of security issue. One of the, one of the networks, I don't know what said, I would, what if there's a security issue? Someone else later told me they thought it was a commercial break. Um, <laughs> Someone thought that someone thought that it, there was supposed to be a certain time where he could speak and that we were ahead of schedule. And they had all these things. And then someone came down. We said, we're so sorry. They had decided not to go through with it because 
for various reasons, but they thought it might scare people. They didn't know, and so they did. They forgot to tell you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Which means Roy, me, and the president. <laughs> okay, so I go okay. So I just go up there and I just smile and I say, now it is my honor to introduce you. That story of that, yeah, that happened. You got to yeah. roll with it, even at a presidential inauguration. Exactly. Well, good. So, so. you wrote in here, speaking of Donald Trump. Um, about 2020, you said the, the chapter was called The Reckoning, or the uh -huh. subchapter was called The Reckoning. The reckoning that Trump got handed from voters on November 3rd, 2020, wasn't the end. Unless the public shows the willingness to ri rise above the petty, angry politics of Donald Trump and vote for, or shall I say hire, representatives who are willing to work collectively for the best interests of our country and tackle the major challenges of our time, the reckoning will s simply continue, but the challenges will only get worse. Yep. Uh, <laughs> I believe what I wrote. Um, and um, I, I believe that what happened in the midterms was actually kind of the second reckoning. The first um, was the votes um, in the 2020 election um, when 8 million more people voted for uh, Joe Biden. Um, and while the Electoral co College Greats, not the same impression, but winning in states like Georgia and Arizona, which a lot of people didn't think he was going to win in, that was a reckoning. Uh, then you go to the midterm elections where the things were tough. We had supply chain issues and the like, but there were many states had election deniers on the ballot that were followers of Donald Trump. What was an incredible thing is that in so many of those states, red states, purple states, those people that were way out there as election deniers lost. In my own state, our Secretary of State was running against an election denier uh, and ended up getting the most votes, more than the governor, right? Um, because the polls showed that over 30% of voters said their number one issue, and that was a lot of moderate Republicans and independents, who maybe didn't agree uh, with everything that the Democratic candidate stood for, but they believed that democracy trumped that, basically. They believe that the fragility of our democracy, which we saw in full display on January 6th, which we saw on full display when um, Speaker Pelosi's husband, Paul, was pummeled with a hammer by a deranged man who was reading stuff on the internet, um, they believe that things were still at risk and that they felt that it was really important not to put election deniers into office. And as we saw from last night, uh, when uh, Donald Trump basically, he didn't back down, he doubled down, right? Um, he called police officer a thug. He said he'd pardon a bunch of the insurrectionists. Um, to me, it was unbelievable. That's still out there right now. It's still a force. And anyone that thinks it isn't should just watch the rerun of that, of the things that he said. And he called January 6th a beautiful day. And I can tell you, if you talk to the families of those police officers, um, Officer Sitnik, others um, who later died, um, they will tell you that it wasn't a beautiful day at all for anyone. So I just think uh, that we just can't deny that that is still out there and that this reckoning will continue. And the goal for me is to keep making the case for democracy, making the case against voter suppression, and then also people like Liz Cheney, uh, who got you know kicked out of her job because she was willing to come forward, and Adam Kinzinger, uh, and before that, people like Jeff Flake, who are willing to speak out. Uh, today, Todd Young said that he would not support, while well, he'll support another Republican, he wasn't supporting Donald Trump um, for president. It's not just about my own party. It's also about independents and moderate Republicans standing up. I want to ask about another completely different issue um, in the book, we haven't barely even talked about the fact that you did run for president in, uh, yes. <laughs> in 2020. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's a there's a there's a T-shirt. I see to it. Show. Yeah, yeah. If only all those Amy's that there were a bunch of Amy's that bought all the Amy stuff, and maybe if they'd all voted, you know, I'd be in better shape. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, and you you talk in the book about the sort of dramatic moment when you realize that. It was time after you did better than a lot of people had predicted that you would do. Uh, that you realized that it was time to bow out. You were in Selma uh, the last time John Lewis was there. A bunch of the candidates were there, and that you and Pete Buttigieg both decided, you know what, it was pre Super Tuesday. It's time for us us to get out. 
fast forward to uh, when Joe Biden became the nominee, he was doing interviews with people to be his running mate. You were one of the people who was being vetted and talked to, and you took yourself out of the running. And you write, uh, you write in here, that, and it happened right after George Floyd, the George, I mean, mm -hmm. not long after the George Floyd murder in your home state. And you had a lot going on. And you write, the interviews seemed to go well, though that soon became irrelevant. While I both wanted the job and thought I would have been good at it, sometimes in politics and in life, the timing just isn't right. In the wake of the George Floyd murder and so many other ever-widening racial chasms in our country, I came to believe that the vice president should put, pick a woman of color. On June 19, 2021, I took myself out of the running. And then you went on to say what you told the, vice, the then vice president, now president. There are many incredible, incredibly qualified women, but if you want to heal this nation right now, this is sure a hell of a way to do it. There you go. <laughs> How hard was that to do? Uh, well, that's never easy because you have dreams and you want to pursue them. And that's a lot of this book is about um, that you start where you are, basically. And um, for me, um, I'd wanted to be president, actually. Um, and I had worked really hard on that campaign. And as you know, we surprised everyone, came in third in New Hampshire, kept going and going. Um, and um, it was an amazing experience, but I also felt that I had a bigger job and that was to make sure uh, that we built the coalition in terms of uh, the vice president, but also that we won that election and that we would send Donald Trump packing. Um, and I thought that was really important for this country, for our own dignity, for going forward as a democracy and everything else that we had to do. Um, but one of the points I make in the book um, is that um, as I said, you start where you are. And I tell at the very beginning the story of going with Raphael Warnock when we had a voting rights hearing that I held in Atlanta. And we went to his church and I hadn't told anyone I had breast cancer. It was in between the radiation and when I announced it. And I'm sitting there and they had a guest a woman pastor who turned out had, um, had severe cancer herself, which I didn't know till the end of her sermon. And I'm sitting next to Raphael and she's just getting, I'd never really seen a woman quite command the room, the church, the way she did. Um, and she was incredible. And at the very end, her whole theme was you start where you are, no matter if the, you're pushed down and you don't get what you want and life's a lot, you start where you are. And I actually use that as a starting point, right? Um, for where I went. And I talk about going with my husband on this hike up to Lake Solitude, um, right after I'd had this hip surgery, which is after the campaign too, all my maladies that I got through. <laughs> um, and still four talk months about later, went on this 14 mile hike, huh? Shingles, don't forget shingles. Yeah, I got shingles yeah. during the, yeah, during the Democratic, in the size of a stop sign. <laughs> like, yeah. It's kind of a message, I think. Okay, <laughs> thank you, one person laughing at shingles. Um, but I, I, we, I couldn't quite make it. I was like 20 minutes short of Lake Solitude and the Tetons. And John knows how I'm so goal oriented and so competitive. He's like, oh, come on, you can make it to the top. And I'm like, no, I, I'm just going to stay here on this rock because I thought I was going to go right down the ice because my leg hurt so much. I, I'm fine. And so he goes up and I'm really feeling sorry for myself. I've got this mask around my thing. It was back then, this blue bandana. I'm dabbing my eyes. I got the cheese and salami. I'm sitting there by myself. <laughs> and and uh, all of a sudden, I feel these, I hear these two like pairs of footsteps coming up. And it's these two older people. And they look really fit in their LL Bean <laughs> outfits. And they're like, are you OK? Like, this is a bad scene, right? I'm saying, no. And I go, no, I'm fine. I, I just, four months ago, I had hip surgery, I had a hip replacement. And they go, and you got all the way up here? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I did. I got all the way up here, I did. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, oh, that's pretty good. So they go up, and then these two kids that we had that had passed us on the trail are coming down. And, and one of the boys is, I don't know, fourth, fifth grade, he's younger. And uh, he looks and he goes, he's got snow all over his feet and his shoes, and he's kind of taking my big rock and he's trying to get it off his shoes. He goes, hey, lady. Did you not go to the top? And I go, no, I just stayed here. I mean, it's a really good view, don't you think? And he goes, 
cool. <laughs> it's like, it's so much ice up there and snow and it's so slippery and you can't even swim up there in that lake because it's like covered with ice, cool. And I go, yeah, cool. cool. <laughs> so there you go, you start where you are. Um. <laughs> I have one final thing and then we're gonna go. Might be a good Wait, by the way, I Ending, have to ask but you. No, no, keep going. Keep going, you are done. intrepid. <laughs> you talked about the fact that you wanted to be president. You still want to be president. I love my job. I do. I love I know, being a I'm senator. not talking about We're now. So much done right I'm not here. talking about now. I'm talking about, you know, you're okay. a young woman. Okay, there we go. It's good. I that love was being not an the answer. Senate right now, it is. That's correct. That's my job. <laughs> you have your job, and I okay. have my job. <laughs> This quote that you that you found, and this is the last um, thing I'll ask you about, because I love it, and I think I'm going to put this on a pillow. May you always remember that obstacles in an oath are not obstacles in a path. Obstacles in a path. This is my... Her hand, she, the fact that you wrote it is really... I mean, with that this town hall last night. This is, what happens, this is what happens when I type it out. Okay. okay. Back Go to ahead. one. May you always remember that obstacles in the path are not obstacles, they are the path. That's right. So that actually came out when uh, John and I were with our daughter and we were on vacation in Slovenia, I'm half Slovenian, and we heard the story from someone there and it was actually an, a story of an American. And uh, she was dying and she wrote her own uh, obituary basically and her own stuff for her kids. She wanted them to see it. And she, they were younger and she said the obstacles are not obstacles, they are the path. Just remember that to your kids, they are the path. So our daughter, I kept giving her wise advice because she was going away to college. So everything that would go wrong, the air conditioner was broken in the hotel room, see the obstacles are the path. The, <laughs> you know, it is the, the plane gets screwed up, the obstacles are the path. Um, but I actually believe that's true and that's one of the things that I've found in politics actually. When you think you just cannot pass that bill, uh, because this person's getting in the way of it, or you can't do that, you find a way, you find a way. And sometimes the people that are standing right in the way end up somehow being the people uh, that you end up getting on your side uh, that help get it done. Um, when this book came out, uh, the was announced in November, The Joy of Politics, um, Bernie's book uh, was announced the same day. And <laughs> um, my book is called The Joy of Politics, and his book is called It's Okay to Be Angry at Capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> and he uh, thought that this was quite hilarious. And so <laughs> in December, when I was trying so hard uh, to get a tech bill passed, but then also to get the Afghan refugee pass bill mm -hmm. passed, a bill that I have with Lindsey Graham that actually takes our the 80,000 uh, Afghan refugees that are here um, so many of them who stood with our troops, helped interpreters, security, and they're in complete limbo right now. And when the Hmong came over, many settling in Minnesota, um, we gave them a path to citizenship or a green card. And that's not the case with these refugees right now. And so I was working so hard to get it passed, working so hard to get Every time Bernie would see me on the floor getting madder and madder, he would come up to me and go, Where's the joy? <laughs> I, just, I don't feel the joy here. Did he have his mittens Where's on? Where's the joy? <laughs> um, and actually, a few of those people, which were a problem right then, I'm not going to say now because i got to get them, are, are working with me now <laughs> uh, to try to get this fixed. So we'll see if it has a good ending for these refugees because they deserve it. They deserve better than they got right now. And, um, but to me, that will be, when we get that done, that's the ultimate, the obstacles are the paths. So. Yeah. Well, as I All said right. at the beginning, this is a very you book. <laughs> um, it sounds like I can hear you telling these stories. Thank you, thank, thank, thank you, you everybody, for thank your patience.